church Night after night Reminding the broken It'll be alright But right now Right now I just can't It's easy to sing When there's nothing to bring me down But what will I say When I'm held to the flame Like I takes little faith to move a mountain well good thing little faith is all I have right now but God when you choose to leave mountains or move a point give me the strength it is well with my soul I know you're able and I know you can Save through the fire with your mighty hand But even if you don't My hope is you alone I know the sorrow and I know the hurt Amen. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. I know He's able. I know He can. But I love that, even if you don't, Lord. Now, I don't know if that, I know the story that that song is based upon, but when I think of that song in Scripture, I think about the three Hebrew boys when they looked at that king and said, Our God is able to deliver us from this furnace, but even if He don't, we're not going to bow down to you. The songwriter uh, that wrote that, Bart with Mercy Me, um, that first verse was talking about standing on the stage night after night. And he said when writing that song, it was a time in his life when his son was very sick. And they was watching as his son was suffering and, and he's still getting up on stage every night. And that's, that's where he, he that birthed out of that situation, that, that tragic time in his life to say, God, I don't know what's going to happen in this situation I know that you're able to heal my son, but even if you don't, I'm still going to get up there and sing. I'm still going to work for you. I'm still going to worship you. I'm still going to live for you. Why? Because it's all about him. It's all about him. Too many times I think we make it about us, 
But uh, Job said, though the skin worms eat this flesh, my eyes are going to see my Redeemer. That's what it's all about. It, it, we're going to face trials and tribulations and hardships. And uh, uh, many have said it this way, God will bless your socks off. But even if he doesn't bless your socks off, and it feels like all hell assails you. Be reminded the gates of hell cannot and will not prevail against you. And just keep serving him. Keep living for him, knowing that you're on the winning side. He is so good to us. Thank you, Gracie. And I uh, just appreciate her tonight practicing and preparing even during a busy week of heading back to school. So we appreciate her this evening. Our children and our teens will be dismissed tonight. If you have a missions offering, you can bring it at this time and uh, place it in the offering plate as well as they're being dismissed. And I hope our kids are enjoying their time back at school, whether it's online or brick and mortar. Uh, they are like the third day, second or third day back uh, for them, for most of them. So uh, we're glad that they are here in church tonight. So. As they're going, as they're being dismissed, let's turn to Isaiah chapter number 6. Isaiah chapter 6, excuse me, as we continue our study tonight on prayer. And uh, we're in our third week of this study. We've got a few more weeks to go. This is a good one tonight, and I'm looking forward to what God is going to do through and in this service. So Isaiah chapter 6, and uh, we're going to read... Um, the first eight verses of that chapter. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. I've preached from this chapter before a message entitled an Isaiah 6 experience. And I believe that if uh, we have not had an Isaiah 6 experience within our Christian wall, we need one. If we've not had it, why is that? Because that Isaiah 6 experience is seeing God. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight in this third lesson, this third message on our series on prayer is seeing God. Let's lift our hands towards heaven tonight. Ask God to, to anoint not just me to speak, but you to receive, each of us to receive what he has for us this evening. Father, we just come yielded and submitted to your will and your way tonight. Father God, committed to your purpose and your plan. And our desire is the same as uh, young Isaiah's uh, desire was when he stepped into that temple that day uh, is, Lord, we need to see you. We need to see uh, your glory fill the temple. We need to see uh, as the smoke fills the room. We need to see that manifest presence of God uh, in our hearts and our lives. I pray for your anointing uh, to speak tonight. Pray for your anointing for each of us to receive uh, what the Spirit is saying unto us as a church. Uh, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, born again, you can do what you're called to do. Do you believe that? Uh, if you're a born again Christian, a believer, uh, you have everything that you need uh, to do what you're called to do. Uh, and what is that? What is the basis of our faith? Uh, what, what it is, as we talked about in our last series, is faith. Uh, you can believe God. 
But what do we say about that faith? Uh, faith plus action equals uh, belief. So understand, no matter what the devil says, no matter what difficulties come, uh, no matter what the circumstances are, you can believe God. Uh, you can do what you're called to do. There's going to be difficult times. You're going to face uh, seemingly impossible situations. Uh, but understand something tonight, child of God. Uh, if you set your heart on God, uh, listen, uh, nothing shall be impossible to you. Amen. If you set your heart on God, nothing shall be impossible to you. And I believe that with all of my heart tonight. If I didn't believe that, I, I wouldn't be standing here tonight. Uh, we do particularly look tonight uh, uh, for a text. Uh, we want to hone in right there at the very beginning of this chapter uh, in verse 1. In the year King Uzziah died, uh, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, uh, high and lifted up, and his train uh, filled the temple. Understand something. Uh, if you pray through, uh, if you touch God, uh, the first thing that will happen uh, is you will see God. Uh, oh, when you pray through uh, and you've touched the portals of glory, uh, you can't help but to see God uh, in all of his splendor and all of his majesty. Uh, there would come as a time, as I said at the onset of this, uh, in every one of our lives, uh, when his spirit, uh, when our spirit, something inside of us uh, demands a reality. Uh, uh, there's something that our spirit demands, uh, I need to see God. God. I need to see the manifest presence of God. I need that reality of who he is. We're not talking about being saved tonight, but we're talking about knowing God and seeing him for who he is. So after years and years of walking with God, the great apostle Paul wrote these words. He cried out that I might know him. There's not one of us sitting here tonight that's read the New Testament that would ever question Paul's salvation. But many years of serving him, he cries out that I may know God, that I might know him. We're speaking here of a knowledge of God that's not based on some argument. It's not based on head knowledge. It's more than the ability to quote scriptures. There's going to come a time in your life when you must know if there, this thing is true or not. Listen, I've got certificates that said when I was a young man in my, my early 20s, late teens, that I was one of the ones ones uh, that memorized the most scripture in our young adult group, uh, but memorizing scripture is not what got it, uh, but what got it and what gets us there. Uh, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, I've read the Bible through uh, possibly every year since I've been saved, uh, but that wasn't what got it. Uh, what got it was uh, when I stayed there in the presence of God. Uh, I can tell you of a time uh, that that same young adult group we gathered uh, on Halloween night uh, while the trick or treat was going out there uh, doing their thing. Uh, we decided to gather there at the house of God uh, and pray until we saw God. Uh, and as we prayed there that night uh, seeking the face of God, we had a heart knowledge. Uh, we had a mind knowledge. Uh, we had a desire. Uh, we had a fire. We had a burden. Uh, but you know what happened there that night? Uh, we saw God. I watched uh, as he filled one of my best friends uh, with the Holy Ghost uh, right there in that place. Why? Uh, because we set not to learn another verse. We set not to do another visitation. We set not to have another game night or Bible baseball. But we set our hearts to say, God, we need to see your glory. We need to see your power. We need to see your presence fill this place. And so when we set our hearts to do that, there's going to come that place where we see him. That was Peter's cry in Matthew 14 and 28. He said, if it be thou bid me come unto thee on the water. That was his cry. That's the cry of the human spirit in its desire to get beyond the ordinary. How many is ready to get beyond the ordinary? Come on tonight. I, I, I want to get beyond the ordinary. I want to get beyond just mere religion. I, I want to get beyond this place that my spirit will cry out. God, take me beyond religion. Take me beyond Sunday school and talking about God. I don't want to just talk about a God that I never see. But have we sent, been to that place? Have we said, I want to know God? That's where Isaiah was at. In this chapter, I've got to know, I've got to see God. 
Now, we're very, very thankful for everything that was done by that first century church. Oh, it's wonderful all the things that we read about that Jesus did in that first century. But I don't live in the first century. I live in the 21st century. I, I didn't live there. I, I, I love reading about it. I love uh, it. It encouraged me. It excites me. Uh, it, it's an exciting thing to read the Word of God. Uh, sometimes I cry. Sometimes I laugh. Uh, you laugh reading the Bible, Brother Jamie? Yes, yeah, sometimes I laugh uh, reading the Bible. Some things strike me funny. Uh, and uh, to see the miracles that took place there. Uh, but as we live in this 21st century, uh, understand something. Uh, the problems seem to be more complex today uh, than they were in that first century. We need God perhaps uh, as no other people's ever needed God before. We need to have that desire to say, let me uh, walk on the water. Uh, if Peter cried that out uh, in the first century, said, Lord, if it be thou, uh, bid me come unto thee. Uh, oh, we need to have that same cry today, uh, maybe even more so than Peter. Uh, bid me to come unto you, Lord. Uh, let me step out of the boat. Uh, let me step into the realm. Uh, let me walk on the water. Uh, let me get out of the religious boat and do what you want me to do. Let me see something happen that man cannot explain. Let me move out into the realm of the supernatural where the only explanation of what's taking place is God's here. Oh, I love those moments. Can you explain that to me, sir? All I can tell you is God's here. I was listening to the radio on the way here. We were listening, uh, and they said on the radio, they said, you've got to love those moments uh, when the doctor says, all I can say uh, is it was something extraordinary. Uh, and some doctors will go for as far as say, that's nothing short of a miracle. They said, you know, when the doctor said it's a miracle, uh, it's a miracle. I love it when God moves in such a way uh, that there is no other answer, no other explanation, uh, but God did it. We don't like being in those circumstances now. We don't like being in those places where the only way that it's going to happen is if God does it. But oh, when he does it, hey, I want that, that moment. There's no other explanation. God did it. Sooner or later, sooner or later, we're going to get to that place. We've got to move into the realm of the supernatural. That explanation is taking place. God's here. Sooner or later, we've got to we, we get to a place that we've got to get dissatisfied with the way things, they are, way things are, the mediocrity, the complacency, the religious formality. Uh, Pastor Jamie, you're not supposed to get that wound up. It's a Wednesday night thought mindset. We need to get to the place to say, no, what matters is seeing God. All that matters is seeing God. It don't matter if it's Sunday morning or Monday morning. I want to see God. I, I want to be in his presence. I want to, to see his glory fill the temple and, and understand that we've got to get to that place. Uh, it has to be so. If you think uh, that you have everything, then you're not going anywhere. Too many people think, well, I've got all I need. I'm saved and satisfied. If you think you've got everything, if you think that you've got this figured out, we're not going to be able to talk to you very much longer because you're going to be like Enoch and be no more. You're going to be like Jesus and be raptured out of here. Uh, but, I, but I don't believe there's any more days of individuals being raptured out uh, because we don't have uh, all. We are, we're on an all-out pursuit, uh, striving daily. Uh, and understand when we know there's more, uh, when we know there's more. Uh, as I told you Sunday, uh, that's where the church of God came from, uh, is a group of men said there's more to it than this. Uh, we've got to get that hunger and that desire, as we said last Wednesday night, uh, there is more to it than this. Uh, don't you believe that tonight? Uh, do you sit there in your pew tonight and say, this is all there is? Uh, oh, Paul said, if I had hope only in this life, uh, I'd be among all men uh, most miserable. Uh, Paul was living in a pretty satisfying time. Uh, we're living in a bleak time. Uh, when I look out across the church today uh, and say, if this is all there is to it, uh, you know what that wants me to do? Uh, hang up my preaching hat, my preaching coat, say it's not worth it. Uh, but I know there's something that goes beyond this platform. There's something that goes beyond this pew. There's something that goes beyond what we see on a regular basis. We can either sit on our seat of do nothing or say, God, I know there's more and I want more. And the only way I can get more is if I press through until I see your glory. Hallelujah. Until I see your presence fill the temple. 
It's got to be that way. Understand that the book of Acts, at this time, as we begin to read it, I don't know about you, but there's a lot of rebukes that come to me when I begin to read the book of Acts. There has to be something that gets a hold of us. All too many people are too scared to admit and confess, been saved over a couple years, a couple weeks. They're scared to say and confess, that convicted me. Can I tell you, I've been preaching for over 25 years. I've been serving the Lord for a long time. But there's times that it don't take a preacher, a singer, a Sunday school teacher. But I can be reading my word, Sister Mosley, and God just spoke my heart from that word. And I have to stop right there. There's times that I've been reading books by Christian authors. I've had to throw the book aside and go fall down in that prayer closet, Brother Mike, because it convicted me. It dealt with my heart. Oh, that we get to place again uh, is something within you you'll say uh, is let me walk on water. Uh, let me be beyond the safety uh, of a religious institution of saying I've got it all figured out. Uh, I want to be where Christ is at. Uh, I want to be where the resurrection is demonstrated. Uh, I want the same power that raised Jesus from the dead uh, to lift me up and if he lives in me uh, scripture tells me uh, that he will quicken this body just like he did Jesus. Oh, we got to get to a place that we begin to admit that we need to fall under conviction. Newsflash for you, church. Pastor, don't have it all figured out. I need that convicting power of the Holy Ghost. Some people may say, Brother Jamie uh, schedules a lot of preachers. Well, I love to preach, but I love to be preached too as well. Brother Elijah, man, that young man just blessed my heart Sunday night. Conviction begin to grip our hearts, begin to, to speak to our hearts. Uh, a lot of times I believe the Lord moves on us to get guest speakers uh, as they don't know anything that's what's going on and what's being preached and taught on a, on a weekly basis in our church. Uh, and, and very few probably uh, go to, live, to, to the live stream on Spreaker or the, or the videos on Facebook to say, uh, let me see what they're talking about so I can talk about the same thing. I don't book people like that. But once it's gone to a prayer closet and said, Lord, what do you have me to say? And then, Sister Rhonda, they step up in this pulpit, and what do they say? Some of the same things that God has been saying to us service after service. They, they just tie their message right into the message that was before. Why? Because God is speaking to his church. We find here in our text Isaiah, known as a young preacher at this time, he had reached a place here in this sixth chapter of the book of Isaiah that he was a student in the theological seminary. He was, a, he was an up-and-coming prophet, an up-and-coming preacher, and, and he had heard everything that there is to hear uh, about the law and about the Torah and all that was going on at that time. Uh, he had heard of miracles of yesterday. Uh, he had heard about the manna that fell uh, for God's children. He'd heard about the Red Sea uh, that parted. Uh, that was a fresh miracle. Those things were fresh off the press in Isaiah's time. Uh, th this was exciting stuff that this young man, man uh, was learning in his time uh, of being preparing him to, to God preparing him uh, to be that minister that we know to be the one of the greatest men of God uh, to ever walk the face of the earth uh, the walls fell down he read about that and studied about that uh, but it's just stories that he, that he had his head believed but it really maybe not have reached his heart we, we find him here in this chapter as a young preacher that had reached a point in his life where his spirit demanded reality. And, and that first verse, what does that first verse say in the year that King Uzziah died? Now, kings died. Kings came and kings went during that time. But as you begin to study about this particular king, King Uzziah, uh, we find Isaiah in a place that he had to know. And according to Jewish tradition, uh, Uzziah, the king of Israel, uh, some scholars say that he was Isaiah's uncle, but most of them say he was his cousin. He, he was a, so whether he was a cousin or uncle, he was a very close relative to Isaiah. He knew him well. So it, wasn't, uh, it, it wouldn't be as if President Trump died today. That probably wouldn't rock my world too bad. I'd hate it. It would be awful that we lost a president. But this was something more personal to Isaiah. This was a close relative. 
This wasn't some distant relative. This was a close relative. Some scholars say an uncle. Some say a very close cousin that was very dear to him. So no doubt he, he's here in this time, and he's heard all of these stories. He's heard all of these miracles. Uh, and now uh, this king, not only the king, uh, but one that he had looked up to. Uh, why? Because scholars tell us something uh, that, that happened here. Uh, there was nothing above the king in that day. The king held the power of life and death. Uh, and Isaiah, no doubt, during that time uh, could have had a very promising career in politics because he was close to the king. It is said, uh, theologians say that uh, Isaiah was so co close to King Uzziah, he could have came and went uh, in the kingdom uh, as freely as he wanted to. Uh, he was up and coming uh, in the kingdom. Uh, he, he was uh, pursuing to be a prophet. He was pursuing uh, that theological path, uh, and he had a mind knowledge and a desire uh, to, to follow that religious path. Uh, but there was also a desire inside of him uh, to do like Uzziah did and move up uh, that chain and possibly uh, ha have a career and a future in politics. Uh, but as King Uzziah began to be uh, an influence in Isaiah's life, really, he began to look up to him. Uh, some say even to the point that he had become an idol to him. He had been one that he invested a lot of interest in uh, on the physical side of things. Uh, he could have been, uh, Isaiah could have uh, it reached a place of being an ambassador. Uh, and no doubt there was a place uh, in the politics of the king uh, for a young man like Isaiah. He was a brilliant young man, uh, a great young man. And no doubt there was plenty of room for him in that kingdom. Uh, but the only problem is God had laid his hand upon Isaiah's life. Isaiah had a promising future either way. He had a promising future in front of him. And that's why this chapter starts off like that. Because Isaiah is not sure what to do now. It come a time when Isaiah said, I'm going to settle the issue once and for all. If God's real, I'm going to know him. There's nothing wrong with that, church. There's nothing wrong with that. To say, I've got to know once and for all. I've heard about him. I've heard the stories. I, I, I've seen the experiences and seen things, but I've got to know God is real. And you can know that he's real when you seek him with all of your heart. Psalms 119 and 2 said, Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with your whole heart. With your whole heart. Now, here's what I, that's what Isaiah was faced with. He knows God with his head, but he does not know him in his heart. He knows the acts of God, but he doesn't know the ways of God. You know what that causes him to be? He's in trouble. He's in trouble. He's in a hard place. So to answer the call of God on his life, Isaiah has to put aside his political ambitions. He has to put aside his carnal ambitions. And no doubt there may have been those in that time, maybe even King Uzziah saying, man, you've got a promising future. You've got a promising future in the kingdom. You, you know we, that we've talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel. Uh, um, some of you may have heard me the other day. I came online and did a little devotion on that from a message I preached a, a while back about these uh, four young men, how the king had come in, and, and King Nebuchadnezzar came in, and he took them. He took them for a reason, because they were brilliant. They were goodly young men. They, they were flawless, man. They were just geniuses. And they thought, man, we can use them and we can manipulate them and we can twist them and we can, we can change their names. So that's the first thing they did. They changed their names and gave them bondage names and, and, and tried to do all those things, but they forgot about something. They had seen God. Daniel was a praying young man, wasn't he? And he, he took uh, Chadrach, Meshach, and Abednego up underneath his wing, so to speak. Uh, they were all about the same age, but he pulled them in, and he had an influence on their lives uh, that they were able to stand up and say what I told you earlier. Listen, King, our God's able to deliver us from you uh, but and your fire, but not even if we don't, we're not bowing down to you. The king did not think about the fact that these brilliant young men uh, had a heart. They had already seen God. So that's Isaiah. He's brilliant. He's, he's got a future, but he's got he's to make up his mind. He's got to understand it. He's got to do something. He's got a decision to make. He's got to put aside these ambitions, but before he can turn loose of the scene, he has, he's got to get to a place that he knows the realities of the unseen. So here's the biggest problem for us as the church today. We as the church are governed by the scene. 
Remember, I've talked a lot last year about the senses. It's, it's all about what we can see. It's all about what we can hear, what we can smell, what we can taste, what we can touch. We've got that Thomas mentality. I won't believe it unless I see it. And, and so, so here's where the church is today. We're saying if, God's, if God is real, uh, I want to see it. And that, that's, that's all right. That's a good place to be in. But we've got this uh, sensationalism, really, that rarely gets beyond the scene and sees you know what I mean? We can't get beyond what is seen. You heard the old saying, you can't see the forest for the trees. We can't get beyond the scene if we can't see it with these physical eyes. Listen, we need to have a vision, but it has to go beyond these physical eyes. I have to put these on to help with this physical scene, but I don't need any eyeglasses. I don't need any contacts. I don't need any help. A blind man can see. A blind man can see spiritual things. A blind man can see God. A blind man can see the glory of God. So we have to get to that place as the church to realize that we've got to get beyond the scene and see who God is, him who is invisible. As Elijah was trying to close out Sunday night, 11 and 27 of Hebrews, I was trying to help him over there, but he didn't hear me and see me. He was trying to find it bad. He read us about six verses and realized he wasn't even in the right place, but that was the cry of Moses there, and how he was able to make it is he said, I've seen the unseen. That's how he refused to eat from the king's table. That's why he refused to be called the king's son and all of that because he uh, had seen the invisible. Isaiah must discover the reality of the unseen. He's well acquainted with the scene. He can go in and out of the king's house at will. How must he move? Now he's got to move beyond the visible. Now the Bible specifically tells us there in that first verse, in the year Uzziah died, Isaiah saw the Lord. What happened when his idol died in that same year Isaiah prayed through? In the year Uzziah died, Isaiah settled the issue as to whether he's going to be a politician or a preacher. Understand something, that every person on the face of this earth deserves the right to accept or reject God on the grounds of reality. No smoke screens. No trying to make it something that is not. God does not need our shows. Amen? God does not need us to make him, try to make him any greater than he is because he is already the great God Jehovah. He doesn't need uh, the help of man, uh, but every man, woman, boy, and girl has a right uh, to accept or reject God on the grounds uh, of reality. That's why we've got to be real. Uh, that's why we've got to be transparent. That's why we've got to be salt uh, and light. That's why we've got to be spiritually mature uh, as he's spiritually mature, perfect as he is perfect. Uh, God never intended his people to be a product of an argument. It's not that the will of God for the church is uh, to be a debating society. Too much debating. Uh, oh, we are to talk uh, uh, back and forth with this debate. We are to talk for God. Uh, we are here to demonstrate God. Uh, and my speech, Paul said, and my speech uh, and my preaching not was enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 4 and 5. What's wonderful about that scripture is Paul could have baffled the brilliant. But he said, it's not about my enticing words. It's about the power of God. It's not about me impressing you with my speech, but it's about the power of God. Paul's testimony was that through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ in Romans 15 and 19. How did he preach? Uh, through mighty signs and wonders uh, so that the Romans believers' faith uh, was anchored in reality. Uh, he said in 1 Corinthians 4 and 20, the kingdom of God is not in word uh, but in power. It is the will of God that our faith be based on reality. Nowhere is it the truth more real than in calling of the prophet Elijah. Remember that? God is about to take the old prophet Elijah home, and he tells him to anoint Elijah, the son of Shapath, 
to be prophet in his room, in his stead. He's going to be his successor. So here's the young man, Elijah, minding his own business, plowing in the field uh, with 12 yoke of oxen, and here comes the old prophet walking by. He walks up behind him, and uh, as he passes by him, his mantle just brushes across him. And he just kept walking. And when that mantle touched him, uh, how many knows what the mantle represents in Scripture? The Spirit, the anointing. The Spirit and the Spirit's anointing. It represents that anointing of God and that power of God. And that was the spirit on Elijah's life. And it just touched Elijah. And when he did, he was hard at work, sweat on his brow. I've never had 12 yoke of oxen, but I imagine that's some work. And he's got 12 yoke of oxen there and one man uh, doing that, minding his business, and that mantle touched him, and he just stops in his steps. Why did he stop in his steps? Uh, he not only stopped in his steps, uh, he dropped the plow lines, uh, and he ran after the prophet. Uh, he didn't care. Uh, that was important business to him uh, to plow that field. Uh, but when that man of God's mantle, when that anointing, when that spirit touched his life, uh, he dropped the reins of everything that was important to him, uh, everything that was important, uh, I'm sure, uh, that he had word from his daddy, said, don't lose them oxen. Uh, don't mess up my field. Uh, this is the, our livelihood. This is our work. Uh, this is what needs to be done. Uh, but when the anointing, uh, when the anointing uh, and the spirit uh, touched that young man's life, uh, all of a sudden the plow didn't mean anything. Uh, the oxen didn't mean nothing. Uh, he dropped it and he ran after the man of God with everything that is within him. Uh, and as he gets there, uh, he's saying, wait for me, man of God. Uh, wait for me. Let me go and kiss my mom and dad goodbye. I'm coming with you. Elijah looks back at him, and you think, man, the great man of God will be excited. God sent him and told him you're going to anoint him. And he looks at him and said, what do you have to do with me? He's, <laughs> he looks at him and he says, what have I to do with you? And Elijah may be with a puzzled look on his face, because this is what he was really saying. Why are you coming after me? Uh, Elijah knew. He knew. But he wanted to see if Elijah knew. Why are you coming after me? Why are you chasing after me, son? Why, why are you going to kiss mama goodbye and your daddy goodbye? Uh, Elijah, we know where Elijah was at this point in his life. Uh, he had just come out of a place of deep depression. Uh, he had just come from a place where he was running from Jezebel, hiding in a cave. Uh, and God pulled him out of there and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Get out of that cave. Uh, I still got a work for you to do. And in that work, you're going to anoint your successor. Uh, and so here he is. Uh, and Elijah saying, uh, I don't have anything to all for you. I don't have anything to give you. Oh, it's a wonderful thing when the anointing in our lives touches somebody else's life. But it's also a scary thing when a young person or a young Christian stands there, sits there. Oh, we love it. We want them chomping on the pits. But it's an unnerving feeling for a moment physically when they sit there in front of us with their mouth watering, so to speak, Sister Mosley. They said, I'm hungry and I'm thirsty. And Elijah's looking at him and said, what do I have to do with you? See, Elijah then forgot probably to a degree how much anointing was really on his life. That was more, just as much for Elijah as it was for Elijah. God said, my anointing's still on you. My anointing's still on you to reach the next generation. So he's standing here and he's saying, what, what, are, what are you looking for? So Elijah, he just went back. He slew those oxen, barbecued them up with the plow, took off after the old prophet, he burned all the bridges behind him. You know what something what happened then? Something had happened in his life that had totally consumed him. Maybe, maybe he was one of the great, whatever you call them, oxen controllers, <laughs> plowers. Maybe he was the best in the business. Maybe he was going to be an up and comer. Any man that could take twelve yoke of oxen, I would think, be pretty good. But none of that mattered anymore. He set a fire with the plow and cooked up the oxen. Why would he do that? He didn't say, here, you take these oxen. Say, that's the same thing we're going to do in a few weeks. We're going to burn those things that we don't need anymore. Why did Elijah burn the oxen? Why, why did he burn the plow and why did he barbecue the oxen, set them on fire? Because he wanted to make sure I'm not coming back to that. 
that never gave me anything compared to what I felt uh, when that prophet touched me. He knew uh, my life is different from this day forward. Uh, do you remember the time when the anointing touched your life? Uh, did you know from that moment everything's going to be different from now on? Uh, everything up to this point really don't add up to much of nothing. Uh, everything to this point uh, is not needed really at all. Uh, why is that? Because I've been born again. Uh, I'm a new creature. Uh, there's a new story. Uh, God has edited my story, and now he's beginning to write something new. Uh, God's flipped the page. Uh, yeah, that's still in my story. Uh, you can still go back and read the articles uh, of my past. Uh, you can still go back and look at the mistakes that I've made. Uh, and I, but Elijah said, I'm going beyond this place. So he burned it all. Uh, one uh, theologian said this. Uh, Edgar Bethany, the Pentecostal historian, said this. Elijah followed Elijah for eight years. We read it in about eight seconds in Scripture. If you're a fast reader, maybe eight minutes if you're slow. But this was eight years. Eight years. You, you remember the story. We, we can preach a 30, 45-minute sermon from it, but this was eight years in the making. They came to Gilgal. Elijah said to Elijah, what did he say? Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. Elijah said unto him, as the Lord liveth, I will not leave thee. Second Kings 2, 1 and 2. He said that at Gilgal. He said that at Bethel. Elijah tried to leave him again, but he gave him the same reply. Jericho, Elijah said again, Tarry here, the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. Again, the young Elijah refused to stay. And now he was at a place. Uh, he had followed him all the way to this point. Uh, but now he was to a place that he'd never been before. Uh, he had come this far. Uh, he had come eight years of following this man of God. At the Jordan River, the old prophet uh, took his mantle and he smote the waters. Understand something. Uh, Elijah had the mantle. He's the one that smote the waters. They parted. Elisha had nothing to do with that. He just followed the old prophet as he went across. We're doing that. We do that in our young Christian walk. We're following the anointing. We're, we're following the ones that's, uh, that, that we're, we're longing to, to have that power in our life. We're staying real close to them. Can I tell you, you find somebody anointed, get real close to them. You find somebody that knows how to pray until they pray through, uh, do what Elijah did. Follow them everywhere they go. Uh, so, so many preachers have said, I'm sure Elijah turned around and got sick of seeing that kid following him everywhere he went. Elijah couldn't go to the bathroom without Elijah being there. Eli Elisha was a lot like we were as little kids. Maybe not you, but I was a mama's boy. They tell me uh, that mama went to the bathroom. She see my hand up underneath the door. Because I'm sitting outside the bathroom waiting for mama to come out of the bathroom. Everywhere mama went, I went. Uh, uh, that my stepdad, they say, uh, put me over chain link fence. Uh, and the gate was over there somewhere. Uh, he put me over the chain link fence. There was no going through the gate. Uh, by the time he got back in the driver's seat, I was already sitting in the back seat of the car. Why? Because where mama goes, I go. Uh, and that's where Elijah was at. Uh, he said, Elijah, where you go, uh, I go. And for eight years this is going on. Uh, Elijah takes and he smolts that Jordan River. And he said, I'm going to the other side. And now Elijah, after eight years of following him, had really been faced with something. The waters parted. The two walked across on dry ground. Now they're on the other side of the river. They didn't get there by boat. They didn't get there by ferry. There was not one around. No way back. Then you had the sons of the prophets saying, you know what? He's going to be taken from you. And Elijah said, hold your peace. I know that. But they're saying, wait a minute. You're going to get on the other side of the Jordan. You ain't going to be able to get back because it's the anointing on Elisha's life. They didn't know why he was following him, though. They didn't know why he was following him. As he goes across with him, uh, God takes the old prophet. Now the young prophet's in a situation. He's going to be on his own, and they were reminding him of that. How will I get back over? Uh, what well, maybe went through his mind. It's an impossible situation. Uh, and now what, uh, what Elijah finally does, he turns around and he looks at him. He said, all right, what shall I do for you? Elijah had a quick answer. Let a double portion of that spirit be upon me, 2 Kings 2 and 9. What he was saying is, I want a double portion of what I felt eight years ago in that field. What I want is a double portion of that anointing that I felt. That's why I've been following you these eight years. 
That, that's why I've went everywhere that you went, everywhere that you've gone. Elijah felt something. He knew something, and there was a reality. He wasn't following a man with an argument. He had tasted the powers of the world to come. He had gotten to that place. He wasn't following Elijah for Elijah. He was following him for that anointing, that anointing that was upon his life. Listen, a man with his own ability and his own strength, can I tell you something tonight, Jamie, why it's not worth following? As a man, I'm not worth following. I wouldn't have gotten you very far if you'd follow me uh, on the physical side. I, I can't lead you to a million dollars. I, I can't lead you to the top of the ladder of success. Uh, but the anointing that is upon my life, I, I can stand up here and boldly declare to you, if you follow me uh, as I follow Jesus, uh, that anointing that is upon my life, uh, God will place upon your life too because that hunger and that thirst for righteousness, uh, he always feels. Uh, so I don't boast in anything of myself. Elijah boasted in nothing of himself. Uh, but to know that if you'll stay close uh, to an anointed man of God and have that desire uh, and say listen uh, I appreciate my pastor I appreciate the man of God uh, but I believe there's even more than what I see there uh, Elijah said I, oh, I felt something in that field uh, but he said I'm a little spiritually greedy I want a double portion of that uh, I want a double portion of that it's recorded in scripture that he got a double portion of that God wants every one of us to have the opportunity uh, to accept or reject him on the grounds of reality uh, uh, Elijah uh, reached that place. Isaiah had reached that point in his life. Uh, there was something in him that demanded a reality. He's being pulled in two directions. You ever feel that way? In two directions. I want to follow God if God is indeed real. But if he's not, I want to know. I have to know. You ever gotten to that place? Have you got to that place in your spiritual walk yet? Seems like I've been there a time or two. And that's where Isaiah was in our text tonight. He said, he said, if God's real, man, I want to follow him. If this is real, I want it. The Bible said that Isaiah saw God. See, that term saw in the Bible, it means to know. And less specifically stated, otherwise it means just that, to know. To know is to see, and to see is to know. Ephesians 1.18, the eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know. That you may know. So in the year that Uzziah died, I saw, I knew the Lord high and lifted up. I came to know God. Hebrews 11 and 3 says, Though through faith we understand that the worlds were framed. How? By the word of God. Isaiah had an experience with God. He met God. Isaiah had heard about God, but he didn't know God. Multitudes have grown up in church. Listen, grown up in church. They've heard about God their whole lives, but they've never known God. Is that you tonight? Heard about God, but never really known Him. They're ever learning, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 and 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They have a head full of Bible scriptures, but they've never met God Himself. I'm not talking about salvation tonight. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about knowing the God who saved us. Now, Think about this, this, this covenant of marriage. When a man and woman get married, they think they know each other, right? Sister, uh, somebody put on Facebook the other day, this young couple asking, how long statistics say that a couple needs to date five years before they get married? They have to know each other for five years before they get married. How long did you and your spouse date before you got married? I said about six months. So we really knew each other, didn't we? We think we know them. You, no matter how long it is that you've dated, you, you think that you know them. But after years of sharing their lives together, they truly come to know each other. After years of being married, Sister Amy and I was almost 20 years. Six months of dating, and we've, we've made it almost 20 years. And we finish each other's sentences sometimes. After you've been married a while. Brother Clendenin said this about him and his wife. He said, they say uh, that when you're married so long that you start looking like each other. He said, I hope I'm moving more her way. That we begin to know each other. We begin to get into that place that we're sharing our lives together, know each other. To know each other, but they're not more, any more married, right? I'm not any more married to Sister Amy than I was when she was just about a perfect stranger standing there beside me in front of my dad at 103rd Street Church of God, and we both said, I do. 
I said, I do, and she said, you will. And there we was. We're no more married today than we were then. We've come to that place that we truly know each other, but now we're not any more married than then. That first day that we took our vows, any of you as well, if you're married. Isaiah grew up on the stories of the Old Testament. He had heard about the parting of the Red Sea, the manna, the waters flowing from the rock, and now he longs to be able to say with Job, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eyes, but now mine eyes have seen thee. That is the strength, that is the strength of life. It's one thing to know about God, but it's quite another thing to know God. You can know everything there is to know about food, and still starve to death. It's not enough to know food. You've got to know food. And so we have to get to that place to, to understand that you've got to eat it, to receive from it uh, the nutrients that's in it. You've got to eat it. You can't, we understand something. We can go to hell knowing about God. Even devils believe and the imps of hell believe and tremble. But if you know God, knowing about God's not enough, but if you know God, you've got the answer to life. He who cometh to God, remember it, Hebrews 11 and 6, you could probably quote it by now. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, that know him. You cannot believe that God is with you. You cannot believe that God is with you in the frustrating circumstances of life unless you truly, experientially know him. You've had an experience with him. You've heard that God can move in bad circumstances. You've heard that God can move in frustrating situations situations uh, and you're saying that's the kind of God I want to serve that's the kind of God uh, that I want to live for uh, and that's probably what brought us to salvation but until you face the frustrating circumstances and you've experienced knowing God you don't know God there's no people who make a, a real start who are truly born again but never press beyond that place never get to that union with God these people are you know what happens? They're easy to knock down. First trial, they're out. They're easily frustrated. Every doubt is abolished concerning the existence of God to those who know God, who have a real encounter with God, who such people can point back to the time in their lives, that Isaiah 6 experience when God became real to them. Isaiah knew the acts of God. Moses knew the ways of God. When trouble came in the wilderness, Israel wanted to go back to Egypt. What did Moses do? He never faltered in his path. Why? He knew God. Isaiah saw God and everything fell into place. Uh, he can walk away now uh, from this political ambition. Uh, so to really, uh, when we really see God, uh, that's the only way for us as children of God to overcome uh, our desire for things. Our desire for ambitions outside of God's will. We've lost a generation because we put the emphasis uh, too much on a full barn instead of a full heart. Uh, but if we as a Christian uh, would really pray through to a real encounter with God, uh, then things of this world uh, would have real, uh, very little value to us. Uh, we understand that it's not about things and possessions. Uh, we're, we're talking about uh, filling up and, well, on the things of this world. Uh, oh, but when we realize it's all about quality uh, and not quantity, uh, it will be begin to see something. Once Isaiah saw God, everything else was secondary. And he became one of the greatest preachers of the Old Testament. He became the prophet that prophesied many things about the life of Jesus. Isaiah wrote concerning Christ in the 53rd chapter of the book. It's called by his name. He said, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Without Isaiah chapter 6, they would have never been in Isaiah 53. Before you can have an Isaiah 53 where you can see and know what there's coming in the Lord's prophecies, you must have an Isaiah 6 experience. The same man that wrote about Jesus and prophesied about the coming Messiah is the same one who was just about ready to give up in the same year King Uzziah died. He was about ready to hang it up. He was about ready to give it in and throw in the towel 
all, but because he didn't, he was one of the greatest men of God to ever walk the face of the earth. Jesus quoted Isaiah. Get this, we quote Jesus, but Jesus quoted Isaiah. He quoted him in Matthew 8 and 17. He said that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. For this message and this revelation, Isaiah was sawn asunder. He died. He was murdered for what he preached, but he had seen God, and it didn't make any difference. He was down and out and discouraged when King Uzziah died, but when his life was on the line, there was no discouragement. There was encouragement. Why? Because I've not just heard about God. I'm not just telling you about a God I heard about. I'm telling you about a God that I've seen high and lifted up, and his glory filled the temple. Oh, when you just know about God, you're not going to get very far. But when you pray through until you see God, all of hell cannot assail and take you out. And to understand that's where Isaiah was at. Understand that's where he's at. This is the message. He had seen God, and it didn't make any difference to him. To know God removes the fear of man. Fear is a big problem. It's a big problem today. You've seen it in 2020, faith over fear. Fear is a big problem in the church today. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power and love, sound mind, but it's still a big problem. Anxiety, you know what anxiety is? Fear. But anxiety is a big problem for us today. People are scared of heights. People are, I won't, I won't bore you with the details of my healing again, but people are scared of enclosed places, claustrophobia. I love telling doctors that they ask that question before you go through an MRI. Are you claustrophobic? I say, I was. They kind of look at me like, what do you mean you was? I said, I'm glad you asked. I was on my way to the Philippines. I began to tell a fear and anxiety. And God has not given us a spirit of fear, but fear is present even within the church. It's a big problem today, isn't it? It's a big problem. If we'd be honest, we could uh, probably say that it's real fear is a real problem in my life, not just the church. We're afraid to be different. Listen, we're, we're not only afraid of heights and afraid of enclosed places, but we've gotten to a place that people are afraid to speak out against the awful mixture of truth and error. We're, we're living in a time that, that we don't want to enter into a debate, so we don't want to speak out. We have a, almost a fear of speaking out of the mixture. We, we've got to stand firm upon that foundation. Not be afraid to speak for Christ. Not to be afraid to say homosexuality is still sin. We, we've got to be able to stand when it's, when it's popular for them and they, they say it's hate crime or whatever. No, we, we're, we've got to the place. Uh, preachers are standing. Uh, you don't see very many preachers calling a prayer line anymore. Why? Because they're, they're fearful. Uh, they're fearful to say, what if I lay hands on them and they don't recover? Scripture says, call for the elders of the church, you anoint them at all, they pray for them, uh, and they're supposed to be healed. And that preacher said, if I pray for them and they're not healed, uh, how, what are they going to think of me? What are they going to, listen, we've just got to leave it at the word of God. We prayed the prayer of faith. Uh, the rest is up to God. We operate in accordance to his word. Uh, we, we don't have no business uh, of what God does. We just do what he told us to do. The disciples tried to question Jesus about that in the end of John. They said, uh, Lord, we want to talk to you about this Judas, about uh, uh, what's going to happen with him. And he said, what's that to do with you? We've got to realize what it has to do with us and what it has to do with God. What it has to do with us is for us to anoint him with oil and pray the prayer of faith. What God does from there is up to him. But too many people are fearful, fearful of what, what their reputation is going to be. Praying for the sick is not about my reputation. It's about healing. Praying for the sick is not about my ego, but it's about his stripes you're healed. And so as a result of this fear, uh, the, everything has become, in, in, this, in the church, the church needs to see God. Isaiah saw God, and he couldn't forget about it. Isaiah saw God, and he couldn't forget about it. If you've seen God, you'll never forget. Understand something. Isaiah woke up and said, I must know. I must know. I'm getting long winded tonight, so I'll try to rush through this last part without rushing through this last part. 
Here, here's, here's the mindset. This is, this is how Brother Clendenin writes it, and I like it, so I'm going to share it just the way he put it here. This, this was his commentary, I guess, of this story. Here's Isaiah. He woke up, and he said, I must know. He said he probably went to the synagogue. And on the way there, he passed by the rabbi's house, and the old rabbi's out there cutting his grass, maybe. And the young prophet he looked at the old, the rabbi looked at the young prophet and said, where are you going, Isaiah? My Isaiah possibly replied, I'm going to the church. Well, why are you going to church, son? It's not Saturday. There's no church today. Here's Isaiah's possible reply, but, but pastor, but rabbi, I have heard you talk about God, how he delivered our people out of Egypt, how he fed and clothed them for 40 years in the wilderness, and sir, I've reread those stories hundreds of times. I've been overwhelmed by the record of such a great God that I can no longer live in the past. I must know God myself. Oh, it's wonderful to hear about those stories of old. I love reading about Smith Wigglesworth and Brother Clendenin and all of these great men of God. But I'm tired of living on stories of the past. Isaiah said, I'm tired of living on stories of yesteryear, of what God did when Scripture says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm God and I change not. So here he is, and that rabbi is possibly looking now with concern because his young preacher, his young protege, uh, his best student's done become a fanatic. He's done become radical. And this radical thinking, he's concerned for him. He says, possibly says, son, I don't want you to be disappointed Young preacher answers, I'm not going to be disappointed. I'm going to find God. He said, listen, he said, I'm going to find God or I'm going to forget religion. That's not wrong. If you don't find God, you might as well quit religion. Because what does Scripture say? That he that buildeth, if God's not the one that builds the house, the ones that are building it are building it in vain. If we're just going to go through religious rituals and ceremonies and just go through the motions... Now, you might be satisfied with just coming to church three times a week. Uh, amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Three songs, a, a special and a sermon and five-minute altar service, and we're out the door. You might be satisfied with an hour and 15 minutes on Wednesday night. Say, man, that was good. I appreciate it. I feel encouraged. Uh, and walk out the door. Uh, Isaiah had seen about all that that he could handle. He said, I, I've got to see God. He said, if there's no more to it than this, I'm hanging it up. If I can't get to a place uh, that I see God, uh, I am done. Uh, I am finished. Uh, and so he said, I'm not going to be disappointed. I'm going to find God or I'm going to forget about this thing. Uh, it's that kind of attitude that's not wrong. Uh, it's, a, it's our right. Uh, you have a right. Uh, listen, Jesus died on Calvary for that right. Uh, listen, uh, he created and breathed nostril, uh, into the nostrils of Adam uh, to give us that right. Uh, that was God's purpose from the beginning. Uh, he created created Adam and what his likeness and his image uh, and he was in communion with him every day uh, and Paul cried that I might know God uh, you have a right to know God uh, you don't uh, have to sit here and hear about God uh, and hear about uh, somebody else's testimony uh, and some say well I'm sick uh, of hearing about brother James' testimony uh, well pray through until you get one uh, and to know uh, that we can know God uh, and know him in his glory uh, and Isaiah was at that place uh, he said I've heard about it and heard about it and heard about it and now I've got to know it oh I've got to know it and so it doesn't matter whether you believe my testimony or not he said I believe it I have met God now it's difficult to deceive a man who's seen God you can deceive a man who's heard about God and who's attended church for many years and maybe even went to Bible college but it's hard to deceive a man who's prayed until he's prayed through. It's hard to deceive a woman who made up her mind she's going to grab the horns of the altar until God moves. Sister Amanda shared on Facebook about a prayer meeting they was in last week here and said the pictures didn't do justice. Just down there with her face buried in the arms, she looks up in this dark sanctuary and just sees lights coming through the window. Uh, not man-made light, but the light of God just began to shine around. And Paul told me in more detail, he said like a fog uh, came across the room. Uh, and, and that's what will happen in those moments of prayer. When you make up your mind, uh, it's going to be very hard to deceive somebody who's had an experience like that. If you've not had an Isaiah 6, 
6 experience, uh, you're probably well on your way to backsliding. Uh, but when you've had an Isaiah 6 experience, uh, it's hard to be deceived. It's hard for the devil uh, to get in that place. He's going to try to. Uh, he's going to do everything he can to kick against it. Uh, but you know it's more uh, than what he's brought against me. It's more than the circumstance. Uh, it's more than the bombarding of the enemy. Uh, because when you've seen God, you know the devil wants to take that out. Uh, when you've seen God, you know there's a target on you. Uh, you know you've reached a different plateau. Uh, as my overseer told me in Oklahoma, he said, Pastor Jamie, you've reached higher levels, uh, and higher levels bring bigger devils. Uh, so be ready uh, to know I've reached a higher level, uh, so I'm ready. Uh, there's going to be bigger devils that I'm going to have to fight. Uh, how am I ready? Because I've seen God. Uh, I know who is on the victory side. Uh, I know who's fighting for me. Uh, I know who's got it under control. Uh, that's where Isaiah was said. Uh, and understand, we've seen a lot of phony. I don't know if you have or not, but I've seen a lot of phony religion. I've seen so much of that junk that I'm sick to death of it. People pushing people down. I had one of them jokers push me down one time. I am there at a, a seminar for MIP. I didn't want to be there. He, they called him the Alabama wild man. Okay. I'm just a preacher. Just God's man. Isn't that enough? And he, he comes through, and I, I made up my mind. He ain't pushing me down. He's not going to push me down. Well, he did. He was bigger than me. He just had a way of doing it. Sister Mosley, they, they just figured it out. Gimmicks. Knew how to, to grab you in the center of your back and the top of your head at the same time and just about take your feet. It was like some martial arts thing, Paul. You can learn some martial arts and get some good gimmicks and be called the Florida Wild Man if you want to, I guess. That's not my desire. I want to see God. I want to see God. I hadn't seen God because some man pushed me down. He pushed me down, but I got right back up. I jumped right back to my feet because there was no, no hole. But I can tell you, I've told, shared the testimony when God put me on my back. I couldn't get up. I couldn't get up. Why? He said, he said I've got you. I've captivated you, and I'm going to use you for my glory. You've been a prisoner of this world too long, and now you're my prisoner. You're, you're in my captivity. You're going to do what I tell you to do. Oh, that was the most wonderful time of my life. But being pushed down by some gimmick wasn't it. We've seen too much of that. I knew God wasn't within a mile of that. It never bothered me. I just got right back up and went back to my seat. I left there the same way I came in. There was nothing different. Why? Because I knew God. I knew he didn't play those kind of games. I wasn't up for games. I wasn't there for games. I wasn't there for, for to find out some way to make people move. Isaiah was at this place. He said, I'm not going to be disappointed. He said, when I come back, I'm going to have seen God. You've got to get to that place that you make up your mind. I'm going to stay there until I see God. If you don't, you're going to be in trouble. When you become to that crossroad, schedule doesn't matter. Time doesn't matter. The clock don't mean anything. What tomorrow holds means nothing. You just have to slip into that place. And if you've never slipped into a prayer closet to say, no demands on God, not to say, Lord, I, give you, I got 15 minutes, I need you to move. No, you get in that prayer closet, and you say, I'm not moving until I see you, God. I am not leaving until your glory fills this temple. Oh, until you've got to that place. There, there's many times that we say, I need God to move, and I want God to move. But you haven't reached the point of desperation because you get up and you walk out before you see God. When you've reached the point of desperation, there ain't no going nowhere. There ain't no going nowhere. You stay there because you know you've got to see God. And that's where Isaiah was at in his spiritual walk. Uh, understand that that's where we've got to be. Uh, we can touch this world if we get to that place. We as the church, we need to pray through. We've got to get ourselves to the altar until once again God lives through us. We can touch our world if we'll touch God. Amen? Did you hear that? We can touch our world if we touch God. It's possible to know the gospel works and still not have the power to make it work. We've seen a lot of that today. We can go through the ritual praying for the sick, yet no one's healed. The church has lost our plausibility, uh, the social dimensions of believing. Uh, we've learned how to be religious without God, and that's got to stop. We must see God. We must know God. We must walk with God. In closing tonight, the world doesn't want a performance. They've got their halftime shows. They've got their concerts. They've got their performers. The world's not looking for another performance. 
Church, too many has tried to make the church cater to what the world already has. And they've made church a performance. They don't come in here. They're not coming in here looking for a performance. They're coming looking for God. They're looking for hope. They're looking for victory. They're looking for breakthrough. They're, they're needing to see the gospel at work. And you know what's not going to get that? Our five-minute prayer meetings ain't going to get that. They've got to turn into all-night prayer sessions. We've got to come back to the altar of fasting and prayer. No understand, as we said about Moses, he endured to see in him who is invisible. Moses saw God. He felt the call to deliver the people. Forty years before the deliverance came, he had the call. He had the zeal. He had the critical moment in his life. He fell alone and he ran. You must know God. Jesus said this in Matthew 17 and 20, Nothing shall be impossible unto you. And what was he telling us there? He let us know in no uncertain terms, there's going to be struggle. There's going to be struggle. Moses did not know that one day he would know him. When that adversary struck at him, what did he do? He fled. But then later Moses saw God at the burning bush. Just like Isaiah had that temple experience, when the glory of God filled that temple, Moses had that burning bush experience. And from that moment, he moved with assurance. What, when is that moment going to come in our lives? That from that moment, everything is different. You, we're walking in a fog right now. We're walking and controlled by circumstances. Oh, but when we see God, after that moment, Moses never questioned God's ability again. Isaiah never questioned God's ability again. At the burning bush, Moses moved beyond the seen to the unseen. From, the point, from that point onward, Moses was sure of himself. Why? Because he was sure of God. Somebody needs to get a hold of that. Just right there. I want to frame that. I want to read it again. And I want you to hear me. Moses moved beyond the seen to the unseen. From that point onward, Moses was sure of himself because he was sure of God. He was sure of himself. You can be sure of yourself. Why? Because you are the body of Christ and members in particular. The power of God, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. You can be sure of yourself if you're sure of God. Quit doubting yourself. If you're filled with the spirit of God, quit doubting yourself. Quit doubting your calling. Quit doubting your purpose. Quit doubting. This isn't in my notes. This is what God's saying to somebody here tonight. Quit doubting yourself you. Quit doubting what I've done in you. Quit doubting what I'm doing in you and through you. Uh, quit doubting what I've called you to do. Uh, quit doubting what I've launched you into. Uh, quit thinking that you're not enough. Quit thinking uh, that you can't accomplish the task. I'm not reading from notes. I'm not reading from Clendenin. Uh, I'm telling you straight from the portals of glory to somebody tonight. Uh, I know nobody spoke in tongues, uh, but this is an interpretation tonight. Uh, a word of prophecy, if you will, that God is speaking to somebody tonight uh, and to assure you and let you know you are exactly who I said you are. You're exactly what I've called you to be. You're none of those other things. Understand this. I'm going to say it one more time and I'm going to move on. Be sure of yourself because you're sure of God. He endured. I want to tie this in with how Brother Elijah closed out Sunday night. I want to close this the same way. How did Moses do this? How did he endure? Because he saw beyond the visible. As we read there in Hebrews 11 and 27, he had seen that one that was invisible. Have you seen the one that is invisible? I'm not asking you if you know God. I'm not asking you if you're saved tonight. I'm asking you, have you seen God? You say, Brother Jamie, no man can see God. You've come too late to tell me that. I've seen his glory. I've seen his power. I've tasted of his presence. And to know that I have seen the power and the presence of God. And that's why I stand where I stand today. That's why I've keep on keeping on and preaching this gospel. That's why Sister Mosley uh, is sitting there today still serving God after all these years because she could tell you I've seen him time and time again. Uh, he showed up in time, uh, on time. Uh, Sister Mosley, if that's the truth, just wave at me tonight. Uh, he showed up in time, uh, on time, uh, every time. Uh, he's been there uh, time and time again. Oh, to see God. To see God. That's what prayer is all about. 
That's what prayer is all about. You know what this is going to lead us into next week? You want to be here next week. Nothing shall be impossible. Oh, when you've seen God, it's getting gooder and gooder each week, isn't it? Uh, to know that nothing is impossible when you've seen God. So, if you want those impossible things, but you haven't seen God yet, it's time to see God. It's time to have an encounter that goes deeper. And that's through prayer. How do you see God? Through a season of prayer. Can we let that season of prayer start here tonight in these altars? You may just carry it home with you. You might just get home and, and bypass the recliner, bypass the bed, and go straight to the prayer closet and pray until the morning. Or you may stay in this altar and pray all night. We may leave and, and, and go home. Even if we lock all the doors, you can go out either one of these side doors, and they'll lock behind you. If you felt like you needed to pray all night long, somebody needs to see God tonight. Somebody needs to realize what Moses realized, what Isaiah realized, what Paul realized, what Peter realized, and what many others throughout the centuries have realized. There's no better thing than seeing God. Father, I've delivered my heart. This evening, God just poured it all out from this pulpit tonight, what I've been placed in my care to deliver what you brought to me through the school of Christ and this study on prayer. Lord, and you've added to that tonight to get a hold of somebody's heart. You know the ones that you're speaking to tonight, and I pray, God, that you just put a deep hunger in each of our hearts tonight, God. A hunger like we've never had before. A longing like we've never had before to see God. Meet with us around these altars. We pray in Jesus' name. Will you come? Join me around these altars tonight. Let's pray. Let's talk to the Lord. Let's see Him for who He is.